basically the economy is stagnating. Most of the major economies basically are running budget deficits. And that, of course, is the source of growth in GDP. It's not productive. So this also conceals what's going on in the under. We are in a sort of rolling recession type thing, which um, it does not is not really reflected in the headlines. And uh, in, in the case of America, the statistics um, are no guide at all to what's going on. Not that they ever. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the NJR Mining Guy over on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host for this uh, conversation today. And I'm joined by a uh, you know, recurring guest, a longtime friend of the channel, Alistair McLeod. He's the head of research over at Gold Money, but he's also now publisher over on Substack. And uh, really looking forward to hearing what he's been up to the last six months. And of course, we're going to recap some of his calls that he's made. As you remind remember we had him on last december 24th which is our german christmas holiday here so it was a, our christmas special and uh, now we're going to recap uh, q1 q2 in the you know first half of the year Lot, lots to talk about geopolitics economy but also gold price development so stay tuned it's going to be a phenomenal episode i'm pretty sure of it although we're just starting to record it so but i, I know i know it's going to be a good one um before i switch over to my guest hit that like and subscribe button it helps us out tremendously leave your comments down below what do you think is happening and uh, are we asking the right questions what should we have asked or what should we be asking so let it let us know alistair welcome back from the program it is good to see you again hello kai nice to see you yeah, we, we got lots to talk about. We just uh, briefly chatted about it. We got content for about two, three hours here easily lined up, but uh, we try to squeeze it into about 45 minutes to keep it you know, palpable here. Yeah. Um, instead of asking my usual question of how the economy is doing and the world economy is doing, let's uh, start with how was it doing the last six months and uh, are you surprised of where we're at right now? Um, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised. Um, basically, the economy is stagnating. I think it's, I mean, I'm talking about the uh, the economies of the Western Alliance, let's put it that way, um, will keep the Asian bit separate from that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think um, this idea that, um, you know, GDP is growing and all the rest of it has been very much down to uh, the extra currency injected into the economy, currency credit by central banks. Um, and, you know, most of the major economies basically are running budget deficits. And that, of course, is the source of growth in GDP. It's not productive. So this also conceals what's going on in the underlying economy. So that, um, you know, this is at odds, if you like, with, uh, you know, if you go and talk to businesses up and down, say, Germany, um, Britain, Australia. Um, I said Australia, <laughs> the US, uh, you, you will find the answer is all the same. You know, it's damn tough trading. And, um, uh, you know, they're not really employing anyone. Um, you know, we are in a sort of rolling recession type thing, which um, does not is not really reflected in the headlines. And uh, in, in the case of America, the statistics um, are no guide at all to what's going on. Not that they ever really are. Um, you know, you can, with statistics, you can tell anything other than the truth. But <laughs> and that's certainly true, I'm afraid, with American employment numbers, which seem to be just made up out of thin air. Good, good point. Like U.S. challengers is one of the you know predictions you made that the U.S. economy will face massive challenges and 4% uh, unemployment rate. I was in South Carolina 10 days ago. And to maybe personal anecdote, and I went to a Ruth's Chris Steakhouse on a Friday night in Myrtle Beach, which you were think, okay, this is one of the hot spots. That's where a lot of people go to golf, especially yeah. in June, perfect time of the year. Friday night, the place was 30% full. Oh. So, and that that's one of the restaurants where I think, okay, on a Friday night, it should be packed, yeah. right? It was 30% full. And while yeah. we're eating around 8.30, 8, 8 o'clock, 8.30, it emptied out. Right. Yeah. And of course, I mean, Kai, the origin of that is that uh, people can't afford really to eat out so often. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's a sign of the stress in the economy. Yeah, that's exactly what it, what it was referring to. Is like, and then maybe on the on the other end, and that's what really threw me off here. We we drove down to Jekyll Island. We stayed at a place on the beach, and we had a room facing the island. Uh, while others, and maybe a, a couple, we met there, 
I wouldn't put them in the highest fine, uh, bracket there. It's like just based on appearance, right? Don't get me wrong. But they were ocean views. They, they had the room with the ocean view, which is like a $450 a night room. And uh, it's sort of like I was trying to figure that one out, the disparity between the Ruth's Chris experience and then the, 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 the Jekyll Island experience. Mm-hmm. I was just intrigued. Like the bifurcated picture of the economy is like – Help me make sense of that, Alistair. Like maybe you well, can help me uh, explain that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the old, I think it's the old old story. It's the difference between Main Street and Wall Street. I mean, <clears throat> you know, financial assets are still um, high in value, uh, which basically means that those who have, you know, stocks, shares, four hundred one ks, whatever, whatever, um, you know, are in a reasonable position. But um, you know, those guys who actually go out and make things or provide services for a living, they're the guys who are struggling. And I think that's, you know, Jekyll Island. Um, Jekyll is incidentally the original pronunciation. I know everybody calls it Jekyll. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, uh, you know, uh, Jekyll Island, um, you know, is such a place in in US monetary history. It's really where everything started to go wrong. (laughs) So I'm sure it's visited by lots of people who sort of, um, you know, um, you know, the sort of pray at the altar of the Fed <laughs> sort of thing. Anyway. No, it was an interesting thing because I was trying to ob- observe what is happening. And the other thing I noticed in the U.S. gas, like the, uh, I paid two seventy eight a gallon at one point yeah. uh, in South Carolina, which was way down from where, where it used to be. I remember taking an RV mm. trip, uh, I think it was in 2022, and we paid about $5.50 a gallon. Ooh. Yeah. Right? So mass, massive decline. And um so, so I'm trying to put it, that into context. Like I'm, I'm observing and trying to figure out, okay, what what am I seeing here? So inflation is being kept artificially low, maybe by keeping ga- gas prices lower, because I've seen uh, the SPR being drained again, and uh, Biden wanting to to empty it again or release some of it, not empty it, but release yeah. some of it, because um, c- it all speaks to like the economic turmoil that you've predicted for the year. And I don't, I haven't seen it yet. I think we're still like cruising along. Um, you know, there's no not really any bumps in the road. We only see small indicators, like you mentioned, the U.S. employment numbers tick up a little bit, but no turmoil yet. Um, when, when do you expect Dudu to hit the fan there, Alistair? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, I, you know, it could happen any time. I mean, to, to my way of thinking, uh, we've got mounting risks, particularly um, on the conflict between the West and uh, the Asian hegemons. I mean, only this week, um, you know, we have seen um, uh, U.S. missiles being used uh, by the Ukrainians uh, to, um, you know, on on the beach in, I don't know, Crimea somewhere. Um, And those missiles could only have been American and they can only have been uh, uh, guided by American satellite technology. So this has definitely upset the Russians. Uh, We have seen Putin go to uh, North Korea. Um, and um, uh, I saw an interview uh, with um, uh, uh, Dugin, you know, the sort of, you know, the sort of senior uh, Russian philosopher. Um, and he was saying that, uh, you know, what's come out of that trip and the trip to Vietnam and all the rest of it is a hardening of determination on the Russian side to turn their backs on the West and uh, no longer pussyfoot around, if you like. Um, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, so that's not good. Uh, we're also seeing um, an American uh, aircraft carrier and its attendant fleet um, going towards uh, Israel, um, presumably to counteract the threat from Hezbollah. So that looks like potentially blowing up. I mean, it's the sort of situation, Kai, where, you know, if you sort of continue with a bullish view on the economy or on stocks on bonds whatever on the dollar um, you could suddenly find that the whole thing gets undermined very very quickly Uh, and for those um, who like us understand that uh, gold is actually the only way out of um, this credit risk uh, then um, you know to sit in your hands and sort of say well I think it might come back a little bit well it may well do but I think um, you won't forgive yourself if these events start um, to come through quite rapidly and uh, you haven't bought. So that's that, I think, um, is roughly where we are. There's a lot of risk here out there, and that's not even the economic risk. I mean, the economic risk is still there, as we've just discussed. And on top of that, um, everybody expects interest rates to fall. Um, 
uh, if they do fall, they'll be manipulated down because uh, when you get a contraction of credit, which is actually what's happening with the, with the over-leveraged banking system, uh, then uh, the, the cost of credit interest rates rises actually so and also you've got um uh, the u.s economy is uh, or the u.s government rather is definitely in a debt trap so you are going to see higher bond yields along the yield curve um and so the fed actually isn't in control of interest rates um any more than anyone else is and i think another thing which uh, we should know is that uh, the only funding now that i think the fed is doing is really as a result of the carry trade out of um the yen. I mean, the, the, the money funds and uh, the banks, I think, have put their liquidity into T-bills. Uh, and now it's up to hedge funds and others, um, you know, to short the yen, take the proceeds and <laughs> go and buy U.S. treasuries with it. Because for the yield pickup, I mean, you, you know, and you see the yen fall and all the rest of it. So that is vulnerable to a sudden bear squeeze, if you like, on these guys in the yen, uh, which could come out of nowhere. Um, I know it seems unlikely, but, um, you know, there are all these dangers. So I think, you know, these summer months uh, where in this country we sort of forget about stock markets, we go to Wimbledon instead, you know, there's all these sort of sporting events that we have in the summer. <laughs> and we tend not to worry too much about stocks and shares and whatever. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I can understand that attitude and I agree with that attitude, but don't leave for Wimbledon before... <laughs> You protect yourself against what might happen when your back is turned. So I can't tell you when all this is going to go. As you put it, the, the doodah hits the fan. <laughs> but there is a significant and growing risk that it could happen at any moment. Yeah, let, let, let's stay on the macro there, Alistair, because I want to talk gold, obviously, and there's lots going on in the gold space that we need to talk about and address, especially yeah. central bank buying and uh, pri the, the violence of the gold price move. But uh, Back, back in December, you mentioned that you didn't expect any Fed to rate cuts any anytime soon. And uh, so far, we're sitting here at the end of June. It doesn't look like there will be any. Uh, maybe in September, we'll see one if we, uh, you know, the market predicts it correctly. But so far, the market has been way off on it anyway. The market predicted up to seven this year. We're down to one now. Um, let, 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 let's talk to that. Like, it, as, as the U.S. economy still seems to be stable enough that the, the market and the Fed seems confident to keep the rates where it is, where they are. No rate cuts. QT has been loosened a little bit. Um, we, we see a bit more, although quantitative tightening is still going on. I, I really want to paint that picture. Like when, when you're looking at the, the Western economies, and we do have to highlight the U.S., what, what are you paying attention to exactly there? And uh, how is that going to continue? Well, um, the problem the Fed has on interest rates is that it's got to fund the U.S. government's debt or it's got to run a monetary policy, which is consistent with that. And I think that um, any sign that it's going to start reducing interest rates and you will find that um, it just makes that more difficult. I mean, as, as I said, I think that the carry trade uh, out of the yen is getting more and more important. Um, the Bank of Japan is being forced um, extremely reluctantly to raise rates. And I have no doubt at all that uh, the Fed is talking to the Bank of Japan and saying, you know, I think, you know, you don't need to raise rates. Keep them low, old boy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Because what they want, they want this, they're becoming dependent on this carry trade, I think, to to um, uh, finance U.S. government debt because the foreigners, I mean, you know, China's not buying. The Japanese institutions aren't buying, that is for sure. Um, I mean, there may be some still doing a carry trade, but I think um, when, uh, as far as the carry trade is concerned, I think it's mainly U.S. interests which are shorting the the uh, the yen in order to to uh, buy U.S. treasuries. It's, it's T bills rather than anything. I mean, this is all very short term stuff. Um, and uh, uh, so I think that is one reason and a very important reason why the Fed um, is delaying on the cut in interest rates. And as I say, um, you know, we, we have this situation where the banks are over leveraged. And I mean, just listen to Jamie Dimon. <laughs> You know, he's made it quite clear that, uh, uh, that he doesn't want to expand his his uh, balance sheet leverage anymore. If anything, he wants to reduce it. So, um, you know, JP Morgan can't reduce its balance sheet as such. What it can do, well, I mean, it might be able to on the margin, but it would be catastrophic for the U.S. banking system. Um, uh, all they can do is move out of risk. And so, you know, they basically what they've done is they've gone out and they've bought, bought um, U.S. T-bills 
three, six months, probably at a stretch, even 12 months, but I think probably mainly three and six months. So the funding of this deficit is a rolling problem, as it were, which is only getting worse because it's the, the average duration of uh, US government debt is declining and declining and declining. And that's a very dangerous situation. But the um, the uh, Japanese institutions, of course, are looking like turning sellers. You had the this um, uh, central bank for the farmers and fishermen um, declaring that they had made enormous losses on their foreign bonds and all the rest of it. Now, it's interesting because the losses aren't on the currency. The losses, I mean, we don't know whether they hedge the currency or whatever. I doubt it, but they've got the losses on the bonds. So, um, you know, I think that virtually every um, uh, uh, bank in Japan and also uh, um, you know the the insurance companies and pension funds. Um, if they leave anything in in uh, uh, U.S. dollars, it's going to be very very short term. So uh, you know this is not something that leads to the wholesale selling of dollars. But if the if if um, uh, the Fed starts reducing interest rates, then I think it's going to make its funding problems a lot more difficult. So <clears throat> uh, you know other other central banks like the ECB don't feel that sort of pressure. Um, because they're not responsible to any one government. So, <laughs> so I think that's the fundamental difference, if you like, between the two. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate the explanation there, Alistair. And uh, J Japan, I think, holds $1.1 trillion of U.S. Uh, bonds, uh, last yeah. time I checked. So, And they're, they're the biggest lender, I believe, to the U.S. Uh, well, yes. I mean, the difference, the difference between number, them and number two, which, of course, is China, is that um, uh, virtually all the ownership of um, uh, U.S. Treasuries in Chinese hands are in uh, U.S. government. Uh, sorry, the, the, the Chinese government or uh, its central bank. So, um, uh, you know, that's to so say you've got one single um, investor who has decided some time ago to start reducing its position. And of course, that's entirely consistent with de-dollarization. Uh, Japan is fundamentally different. Um, you know, the the um, the Fed or the U.S. Treasury can't go to the Japanese government and say, you know, can we cooperate on this problem? Because it's not the government there that owns all these um, Treasury, um, you know, notes, bills, whatever. So so um, there is this fundamental difference. The Japanese situation is not controllable as far as the U.S. is concerned, other than the bribery of keeping interest rates up. Yeah, there was just some use this morning. I was just reading on Reuters, Alistair, that uh, the Japanese might actually uh, increase QT more more than expected and uh, raise uh, raise rates again as well. So that could be an interesting uh, trigger uh, out of out of bonds and to maybe help bring the system down. I guess <laughs> is that yeah. something you've well, you've witnessed as well or you observed? Yeah, I mean the, the the inflation rate. Well, I mean I I don't care about these things particularly because they're all made up anyway. But the inflation rate in in uh, Japan appears to be higher than than two percent. So, uh, you know, I think in terms of uh, the logic of um, you know managing interest rates uh, to control the rate of inflation, which is actually a complete no no. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 all mythology. It's just smoke and mirrors and a waste of time i mean i think we've just got to look at what's happening to the sort of funds as it were um which is why i would insist that um uh you know from the fed's point of view they don't want to see the bank of japan raising interest rates i mean perhaps on the small margin maybe um they would rather that um you know u.s hedge funds and others could continue to short <laughs> <laughs> yen uh, in order to buy dollars to buy um, uh, treasuries or you know T-bills. So, I, And I think that's what's driving the whole thing at the moment. I, I don't think we need to look much further. Yeah, it looks like that, that carry trade, that arbitrage, that spread gets smaller as well because the 10 year is at 4.25 right now. So that is, is shrinking because the yield is coming down surprisingly. Uh, seems like there is a bit of a rush in, into that market. Yeah, um, but you know, I think looking at at uh, the yields along the yield curve, um, I don't expect it to remain a negative yield curve um, for very long. I think um, as the funding crisis becomes more and more obvious, you're going to see those yields along the yield curve rise. Um, so uh, we can say that I think, irrespective of um, uh, Fed interest rate policy because it's driven by supply and demand. And the supply and demand is driven by foreign supply and demand. And uh, this is the key thing. 
And if the foreigners aren't buying, if the foreigners continue to sell, um, I think that even domestic institutions, uh, um, other than the pension funds and insurance companies who feel obligated to put um, X percentage of um, you know, their, their, their uh, income, as it were, into uh, US treasuries, other than that, I think you'll find that there are sellers. Um, other foreign holders, um, I think equally will be less keen to buy US Treasury debt out along the yield curve. And I mean, the fact is that the US Treasury is in a debt trap. Um, you know, I mean, with debt increasing by a trillion every less than 100 days. Um, I mean, I, I actually think that the budget deficit is still being underestimated by um, the Congressional Budget Office, which recently revised its figures. Uh, my personal expectation is it will be over three trillion in the current year to September. Do, do, you, whether, do you, you know whether it's that high or not is actually not that material. I mean, the fact of the yeah. matter is they're in a debt trap. <laughs> do, do you see signals of a funding crisis already? Um, I find it quite interesting, and I think we did, talked about that as well. I just typed into Google U.S. government bond issuance uh, and, and to the news section, and you can't find barely any coherent articles yeah. about U.S. government bond issuance. It's like yeah. it's, it's mind blowing to me. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the extraordinary thing. I mean, this is obvious, absolutely obvious for anyone who looks at the numbers, but nobody seems to be talking about it. <laughs> it's puzzling. I just typed it in US government bond issuance demand. And there's maybe an yeah. article from a week ago, then October 2023. Like there's nothing really like being reported on that matter. And I think it is vital. That's why it's like I'm asking, like, do you, do you see signals of a funding crisis right now? Well, yeah, I mean, Kai, it's, it, you know, it's not just U.S. Treasuries. I mean, all markets are living on, in, in fairyland. Um, I mean, look at the situation in the U.K. We're about to get, I mean, it's almost dead certain, we're about to get a highly socialistic government, uh, which um, is going to be less successful at containing the budget deficit uh, than uh, the current conservative lot, if you like. Um this, I think, is going to scare the foreigners out of sterling. I mean, it's bound to. Uh, so I can see sterling falling to test the lows that we saw well, back in 22, I think it was, uh, when it got down to $1.08. And we're currently, what, one twenty-six and a half, one twenty-seven, something like that. So, and I actually think that it's going to challenge the one-to-one, -one, you know, parity against the dollar. That's a 26.5% that's a fall. Uh, in sterling. So, you know, what you, should you be doing as a UK resident? Well, you should be buying gold sovereigns because you're going to get a 27% lift, even if nothing happens to the gold price. Mm. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and uh, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing um, the yield on, on UK gilts being less than the yield on US treasuries. Now, we know that um, US treasuries are not the best thing in the world, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's meant to be um, yeah, you know, sort of, if you like, the, the, the credit reference, the zero, the zero risk credit reference. I mean, so why gilts yielding? Yes, less. I mean, why, for that matter, are French oats yielding less? You can see that, you know, markets are just completely screwed. Um, and at some stage, you know, they're going to snap into reality. And uh, <laughs> you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, this could happen at any moment. Uh, you know, probably when you're watching Wimbledon. <laughs> Probably. Alistair, <laughs> um, like, I think we have been talking about that as well. Like $2,000 US per ounce of gold was always like one of those magical hurdles that we had to jump mm -hmm. over. But also we talked about is like, oh, what, what does the world look like when we are at $2,000 gold? Like there were predictions while the US won't be able to repay any debt. It just means that the world is in a world of hurt financially and that there's massive trouble on the horizon or even happening already. Um, we're, we're not seeing it. We're about $2,400 gold an ounce. Um, yet, like, if, if you look back now, what should be the implication of a, of a high gold price that, or the high gold price environment that we're in right now? If you if you were to look back um, at it, it's like we usually talk about it, it's like, oh, this is causing a higher gold price. But let's look at twenty four hundred dollar gold and say, OK, what is this causing? Well, I think there's a misunderstanding about um, what twenty four dollars, twenty four hundred dollars gold price really means. I mean. You know, we can we can illustrate this with um, the actions of the um, People's Bank of China. Um, you know, read all the headlines. The People's Bank of China has been buying gold. That's actually got it completely the wrong way around. What the People's Bank of China has been doing is selling dollars. 
<laughs> and the distinction is terribly important, Kai. Understand that it's a distinction and you'll understand actually what's happening. Because what the, um, the People's Bank of China is, is in effect saying is we think the purchasing power of dollars in our reserves is going down. Now, there are various reasons why that might be the case. But it is the purchasing power of the dollar falling, not the price of gold rising. And this is, you know, this is where everybody gets gold wrong. And particularly the establishment, if I could, the, the bullion banks in London, um, the swaps on COMEX, um, you know, all these guys, their only experience has been in a fiat currency environment since particularly the mid 1980s when everything was financialized with Big Bang in London and so on and so forth. So what they're doing is they're trading something you know, they account in dollars or they account in euros or pounds or whatever. Um, and uh, so their comparison is profits and losses measured in the fiat currencies. But actually, in monetary terms, because gold is legal money without counterparty risk everywhere, and your and mine currency are not counterparty risk free, and they're not used everywhere, you can see where the risk is. The risk is in the fiat currencies. So you know, on that basis, what we're seeing with um, People's Bank of China and also all the other central banks who are doing exactly the same thing is they're sending a very clear signal that they're seeing the purchasing power of fiat currencies declining. Um, so where do you get out? I mean, do you sell, you know, do you sell dollars for I don't know, yen? Well, we've just knocked that argument on the head. Euros? No. <laughs> I mean, the answer, Kai, is that, you know, the, the dollar is the king rat of currencies. It is the number one fiat currency. And if you're going to get out of the dollar, you've got to get out of fiat currencies full stop and you've got to go into gold. And this is the conclusion that central banks around the world, are, 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 you know, have woken up to. Um, and of course, this also doesn't uh, augur well for uh, U.S. Uh, debt funding from foreign sources. Maybe sort of expecting or knowing the answer here now is like, uh, but are you were you surprised by the violence of the move, like the fast pace of how quickly gold moved up to twenty four hundred dollars? And uh, maybe as a, as part B of that question, like why did uh, the engine lose steam here, and why didn't we plow ahead to maybe three thousand dollar gold? I'm exaggerating potentially here, but uh, <laughs> why did we run out of steam? Well, I mean, if you look at the charts, you know, this is, this is what everybody does when they don't understand what's going on. Look at the charts. and You can see there's been a long consolidation period. Um, and uh, so the breakout was bound to be, you know, um, pretty dramatic. Um, but, um, you know, dramatic initially. Um, and again, talking purely in charting terms, it's the start of a new bull phase. So that's where we are. I think what we've seen is we've seen sort of part one of the new bull phase um and uh you know that was a run up to what 2445 or whatever it got to we're now consolidating that and we've been consolidating that for the last two months or so two or three months uh, and at some stage that consolidation will end and off we go but as i say what it's actually about is the the declining purchasing power of the dollar which you know we're talking about when we look at the gold price or you know if you like <laughs> dollar priced in gold um and uh you know that's going to continue to de to decline i mean you know what what actually what gives the dollar its value i mean you know we're talking about bits of paper or <laughs> units units on a you know in some sort of um, electronic account um it's just faith in it it's just faith that's all it is what gives gold its value well you can actually hold it and it's legal money you know, this is, this, is, this is the point. I remember when we were, uh, you know, when you very kindly invited me to talk in Frankfurt, I made this point to, to the invited audience. And, um, uh, you know, I don't think people understand this point enough. So um, gold will continue to appear to rise, but actually what's happening is that it's um, fiat currency is falling. But there is another element to this now, and that is that I think the understanding of this is going to, uh, spread, widen, and particularly amongst Chinese savers. Uh, the point is that the Chinese um, as a nation are a saving nation. Um, it's estimated that Chinese households uh, save 35% of their income. Now, 35% of their income is 
uh, around about six trillion dollars on um, uh, Chinese GDP. So six trillion dollars. Where does it go? Property? Yesterday's story. Stock market? Not really. It goes into bank accounts and it goes into gold. And I think it's going to increasingly going to go into gold and also silver because um, Chinese individuals can't go and buy foreign currencies or uh, foreign stocks or anything like that. They don't have these avenues which we have become accustomed to, whether the avenues are good or bad. It's a secondary question. But as far as the Chinese individuals are concerned, um, their banks will offer them the facility to deposit money, you know, currency, you are in, in yuan accounts or alternatively in gold accounts. And as long as you've got a minimum of about five or six hundred yuan, which is what, about eighty dollars or something, uh, you can open a gold account and you can accumulate your savings into that. What does the bank do? Well, the bank has to go out and cover these liabilities. Now, it might do it on a fractional reserve basis. I don't know, but I doubt very much that that's going to be the case. I think they will try and back it with physical bullion as much as possible. Of course, we don't see this necessarily because um, the accumulation of gold reserves, say that um, you know any of the major um, Chinese banks, will be in the Shanghai Gold Exchange vaults. So this isn't going to be delivered to the public, which incidentally has already delivered something like twenty-seven thousand tons of gold into the public. So you know this is gold. This is why gold is moving. Um, I mean, the pricing of gold has actually moved to Shanghai. Um, you know, we're just dealing in sort of paper which <laughs> pretends to be the real thing um but it's not it's not <laughs> so these are interesting times if i can say that um does the chinese would say live in interesting times yeah v very interesting times because uh, a couple of weeks ago we had uh, what do you call it super friday for the for the gold price but in a negative terms like uh, maybe uh, i'm not sure we need to come up with a better term for it but uh we had the jobs report, but then another news release came out that the People's Bank of China didn't buy any gold in May, and that really pulled the pulled the rug under the gold price for a bit. And I've just uh, got a couple of like headlines here. Uh, gold is so expensive that even China's central bank stopped buying. Right? Um, that doesn't make, doesn't sound like a very logical headline, to be quite honest. Understanding what we discussed and where things are potentially headed here, but uh, l l let's dive a little deeper. Like, a, do you believe, uh, you know, the announcement? Does that make sense? And to, why would they stop buying now all of a sudden? Like, what, what's the logic behind that? Do you really believe they've stopped buying it? I, no, you know, I've got no idea. I mean, we actually don't know what they've got. We can only go on what they say. And um, we all know governments lie through their teeth. So why should we stop <laughs> believing, believing the People's Bank of China, you know? I mean, the fact of the matter is that, um, and this is fact, this is fact. Long before um, the Chinese people were allowed by the government to accumulate physical gold, the People's Bank of China was accumulating gold for the state, and it was siphoning this off into various state accounts to hide the degree of gold accumulation. They were appointed to do this by law, and I've got an English copy of this law, back in uh, 1983. And it wasn't until 2002 that they suddenly turned around and said, OK, uh, we'll let the people buy gold and we, and we will set up the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which is controlled by the People's Bank, incidentally, uh, in order to facilitate them to do this. Um, and then they started advertising to people, rush out and buy gold. You know, this was the Chinese government advertising, you know, the merits of owning gold and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, the, the state, I reckon that by the time 2002 arrived, and remember, we're looking at a, a market which was a bear market in gold. Um, gold was being, uh, uh, if you like, um, uh, rejected by the Western capitalist fiat money system, so much so that it went down to, you know, around about $250, um, uh, you know, from sort of, you know, a very brief peak at over $800. And it was during that massive bear market when everybody in the West was getting rid of gold that China was quietly sort of buying it in, you know. I mean, they were the hidden buyer uh, of, of, of gold. And they've accumulated. I reckon that by then they'd probably accumulated something like 20,000 tons at contemporary prices. Um, and 
you know, it just made an awful lot of sense because, you know, China wasn't exposed to Keynesian economics. Um, and uh, therefore, they understood that gold is 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 true money. Um, and uh, I, I understand that even in, in Mandarin, uh, the word for gold is the same word as for money. So, <laughs> you know, we know what they're, you know, how they see this, this thing. So, you know, what do you do when you're, um, you know, getting all this foreign uh, uh, inward investment in the uh, sort of 80s and going into the 90s and then your huge export earnings, um, you know, and you're controlling um, the entire foreign exchange situation um, because you're not allowing ordinary Chinese people to go out and buy foreign currencies for whatever reason. But given that that is the case, what do you do? You take those flows and you look at something like, well, it makes sense to put something like 10, 15 percent of those flows into gold. You know, and that gives you somewhere between 20 and 30,000 tons at contemporary prices. Now, they won't have stopped there, of course. Um, I'm sure that they've continued to accumulate gold from time to time. We don't know whether the accumulation that the People's Bank of China uh, has been reporting until, you know, it appeared to have stopped, uh, has been drawing down on its existing stocks, which it bought back in the late 80s, early 90s. Or, you know, we just don't know. <laughs> It's just a book entry. That's all it is. So, uh, but what we do know, and I think this is the point which everybody should understand, is that China is a savings-driven economy. There is absolutely massive, massive quantities of currency which is seeking an investment home. And that is around about six trillion a year. And I would have thought that gold and silver would be the most effective hedge for Mrs. Wong or whatever, <laughs> living, living in one of those mega cities in, in, in China. So, you know, that, that I think is the real driver. I mean, I forget what uh, the People's Bank is doing. And anyway, as I said, I mean, basically the People's Bank is trying to get rid of dollars and that's actually what's dri driving its, its uh, foreign exchange policy. Yeah, I think we, we spoke with Alexander Stahel of burkram.ch, uh, just last week or 10 days ago here on the channel as well. And he made an effort to, for emphasizing that the real estate business in China is dead, that everybody used to invest into concrete gold, and now it's yeah. proper gold, precious metal gold, and uh, <laughs> sort of shifting focus because the, the real estate sector is imploding in, in China right now. So people are looking for alternative investment uh, solutions, maybe ideas there as well. So r right to your point there. Um, Alistair, since I, since I have you, we do have to talk a little bit uh, alternative currencies and de-dollarization. There's, there's been a few articles and things I've been um, that popped sort of up on my radar screen. One is uh, Saudi Arabia recently joined uh, a BIS, which is the Bank of International Settlements, and China-led Central Bank Digital Currency Project, um, which, which is really interesting because that project has existed for a while, but now Saudi Arabia joined it as well. Um, Run us a bit through the scenarios that you're seeing right now in terms of uh, de-dollarization, but then, of course, alternative currencies here. Yeah, I mean, this is um, an initiative. I'm basically, the problem I think that um, traders have is that they've got used to the dollar, if you like, as the, as the, as the trade settlement medium. Um, internationally, everybody accounts in dollars and all the rest of it. So replacing the dollars is actually quite a logistical headache. Um, the uh, you know the sensible thing to do um, is obviously you know to to um, put you know to to do this on a gold standard if you like, um, but this is a very difficult thing as far as China is concerned. Uh, China's problem is that she knows that if let us say she does move towards a gold standard, <clears throat> then that's going to undermine the dollar. It'll collapse the dollar, in fact. I mean, there's no two ways about it. Uh, and uh, China does not um, uh, have a policy, if you like, of being aggressive uh, in these matters. Um, you'll see that virtually her, her entire foreign um, uh, um, relations policies is, you know, basically let everybody else make the mistakes. We will then defend ourselves from those mistakes, but we will not create problems. So um, that's the Chinese approach. And I think that um, really what China is looking at is some sort of alternative to, um, you know, gold uh, 
directly. I mean, she knows that she's going to eventually going to have to go on the gold standard. But in the interim, what she needs to do is to find something else uh, so that she can do um, a growing portion of a trade, not in dollars and also probably not in her own currency. I think she's, you know, sort of rather wary of losing control of her currency. She doesn't want her currency to become a reserve currency. Um, so I think that's what's driving this this um, uh, situation. Um, uh, and, that you know, that it's really basically trying to do, a, you know, without currencies. I mean, I had a look at uh, the Bank of International Settlements paper on this. <clears throat> and the one thing I couldn't find was what this, you know, what's it called, Embridge or whatever, what's it backed by? There's no backing mentioned about it at all, you know, which which I think is a is is a huge great error. Um, uh, if they turned around and said, uh, you know, this is going to be backed by gold, um, and uh, you know they do it in a credible way, then I think it would make sense. But at the moment, I think it's probably more in the planning stage than anything else. I don't really. I mean, they may, you know, they may do a few sort of trial settlements or whatever, but. And I think as far as the Saudis are concerned, I mean, you know, China is their uh, largest customer by far. So if China sort of suggests something, you know, they're going to look at it. Of course they are. And, you know, I don't think they've made any commitment, incidentally, uh, to this Embridge thing. I think that they're, they're so, sort of um, saying, yeah, yeah, well, you know, we'll look at it. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, yeah, and I think that's about as far as it's got. There's like I'm quite intrigued by the role of the BIS in all of this because I interviewed Chris Powell the other day. He's uh, you know secretary and treasurer of GATA, like the Gold Antitrust Action Committee there, and uh, he, he keeps talking on and on about the BIS and how they're involved in in the swaps uh, that that keep the gold price uh, down as well. So I'm trying to make that connection and try to figure out okay what what is actually happening behind the scenes here and what mm. is the motivation of the BIS to establish the Embridge system that you mentioned in, in comparison because the, the U.S. and everybody else is a member of the BIS like pretty much all countries are involved there. So it's like I'm trying to figure out what the motivation there is. Are they just an intermediary that really tries to make, uh, tries to please everybody by looking at all the different opportunities? Or like, do, do you have an inkling of what the motive of the BIS would be to be involved in a system or creating a system like that? Yeah, I, I think I think the answer is actually quite simple. And that is that uh, the Bank of International Settlements is the, if you like, the research center for uh, banking evolution or central banking evolution. Um, it hosts central banks um, uh, representatives um, on a sort of Chatham House free chat basis every two months. Uh, so you get the exchange of information. And of course, it's the way in which, um, you know, a cynic might say that the, the um, you know, the Fed and the ECB and all the rest of it ensure that other central banks are thinking on the same page. Um, but uh you know, the Bank of International Settlements has, has, has centralized, uh, you know, particularly all the research in CBDCs. Uh, and um, it is, if you like, the go to place um, <clears throat> for what everybody is thinking about doing with CBDCs. The Bank of England, interestingly, produced a, a white paper. A white paper is, if you like, a sort of proposal. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a sort of, you know, proposal rather than anything else. Um, and uh, on CBDCs, and interestingly, they didn't go down the Bank of International Settlements route, uh, whereby CBDCs would be seen as a means by which a central bank could control the application of credit in the economy. Um, what uh, the Bank of England proposed was that uh, you know a sterling CBDC would be, um, you know, it would be um, uh, managed, if you like, through uh, the commercial banking network. Because the problem with the CBDC is that if a central bank is going to issue a CBDC under the Bank of International Settlements pr proposal, every individual, every um, uh, uh, business will have to have a, uh, an account at the central bank, bypassing the commercial banks, in effect. Okay. Uh, and uh, that is, I mean, the idea, I can tell you in this country, the idea of getting, uh, you know, the software and you know the committee stages and all that i mean that's a 20-year project and then it probably wouldn't fly anyway um and i think as far as america is concerned um i don't see her buying this at all i mean bear in mind that the commercial banks basically fund all the politicians 
Um, you know, are the commercial banks going to vote for like turkeys for Christmas? I doubt it. I just don't <laughs> see it. So, um, you know, this this is a this is a sort of project, you know, which everybody sort of, you know, all modern thinking people have got a grasp. You know, this is going to change. We're going to have CBDCs and all the rest of it. I, mean, I think there's an awful lot of hype around it, really. And I put this Embridge thing sort of in that category. Um, but I mean, the one thing I would say, which 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 um, means it might not be quite in that category, is that the, the fundamental difference between China and Russia's approach to its economy is that the state runs the affairs, the state takes the basic decisions. Um, they've evolved from communism, which is total control, to uh, allowing um, individuals to run businesses, to act as entrepreneurs, but always, always within the guidelines, within the control of the state. So they are perhaps um, more in tune with the idea of a CBDC where um, the government controls credit than say we are in the West. Um, so I think that's uh, you know, slightly, you know, a slightly comp complex answer to your basic question, but uh, you know, I'm not taking the CBDC thing all that seriously, but I would say that I think the situation is or could be fundamentally different um, in Russia and China. Now, I find it interesting because Swift also planning to launch a central bank yeah, a digital currency platform in the next 12 to 24 months here. And, uh, you know, Swift, we, we all know is being used by 90 percent of all digital payment transactions here as well. So I'm curious what, what that really means, but we'll, we'll save that discussion for another time, Alistair, because, um, you know, we, we both have hard cutoffs here today. So really, really appreciate your time. And of course, we, we can learn more about the C CBDCs and the impacts and your thoughts, of course, on your Substack. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my, I have a Substack, which is uh, McLeod Finance Substack, or I mean, the, the, the address is alistairmcleod.substack.com. But um, not many people will be familiar with the spelling of my name. So just Google McLeod Finance <laughs> Substack and you'll find it. No, or you might put in you might put in a link uh, to this this video, which uh, I, I be, appreciate very much. I mean, the, oh, whole, well, the whole point about it, Kai, is that um, I'm on a mission to educate as many people as possible. And we're not not just, you know, gold bugs and silver bugs and all the rest of it, who who would be, let us say, the normal uh, uh, customers of gold money, where, I, you know, my stuff is still published. Um, I, I, you know, I want to appeal to a wider audience, uh, to people who don't realize, um, you know, the difference between money and credit and um, the fact that money is still gold, has been since Roman times, legally it's in all our common law, etc etc what governments are doing to credit the future of credit you've got to understand economics you've got to understand geopolitics so i cover all these subjects and uh, you know i would encourage anyone um and, and i mean interestingly i don't have a huge number of followers in on my Substack in germany and um, you know this is a nation which has been wiped out twice in the last what hundred and something years um hundred years uh you know currency wise um it's, it's going to happen again, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, it seems a pity that the current uh, generation of, of, of Germans just don't seem to be aware of uh, the danger which is being repeated on their grandfathers and great grandfathers. Sad but true, Alistair. You're absolutely right there. And uh, we, we love gold to a degree. We love gold mining stocks, but uh, but that's more the older generation, I have to admit. Like when you, when you go to conferences and events, um, we we do see like a few younger investors come to, to Deutsche Goldmesse, but uh, the ratio is completely out of whack. After yeah, that. absolutely. So, and I uh, mean, it's um, you know, I, I was at a uh, I was speaking at a conference in Zurich in I think it was April, and again it was exactly the same thing. You know, you know around the continent, it's 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 the old wise heads, you know, who have um, a bit of a knowledge of history, maybe uh, lived during times uh, before. Um, uh, 1971. Um, you know, they're the ones who are a bit more curious about what's going on than the younger folk. I mean, the younger folk, perhaps, you know, you're looking at these conferences, you're looking like at people in the mining industry, you know, mining executives, geologists, 
um, that sort of thing. Venture capital uh, guys, um, uh, you know, the the um, M and A business, all that sort of stuff, which is all younger stuff. But I mean, they don't actually understand the monetary side of thing. They're just looking at businesses from mining businesses from the point of view of profitability. And as far as they're concerned, a higher gold price basically makes a mine more attractive, if you like, you know, assuming that the costs don't rise <laughs> faster than the gold price. So, you know, this is, um, that's what we see, isn't it, Kai? I mean, you know, it's, it's just, um, it, you know, the, the younger generation, um, I'm afraid, um, are still asleep on this one. Now, Alistair, you just wrote our mission statement for the channel. I'll just copy and paste that because that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're discussing the macro to understand the micro. That's exactly yeah. what we're doing. And I uh, really appreciate your time, Alistair. Again, I'll copy and paste what you just mentioned. I'll use it as the mission statement for the channel. So uh, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, Alistair. As always, a huge pleasure. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financial. You just heard from Alistair. Educate yourselves. There, There's a storm coming or we're in the middle of it already. feels like we're in the eye of a hurricane a little bit because the uh, last couple of years have been turbulent. Uh, it's quiet down a little bit. And uh, let's see what comes on the other side. But uh, educate yourself. Follow us here, follow other informational YouTube channels, get educated. It really helps make better investment decisions. Tremendously appreciate Alistair's time. Did we ask the right questions? Was the content of value? Leave a comment, leave a like. We do want to hear from you so we can create better content. And of course, your subscription helps us bring guests like Alistair onto the channel and bring other great guests on as well. So thank you so much. Really appreciate the support. And uh, we'll be back with lots more here on Soar Financially. Thank you. <laughs>